Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Also can be found every day, Monday through Friday, at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific for a full hour on the Nothing But Net channel on Dash Radio. So if you don't hear us uh, on all our usual podcast platforms, whether it's Spotify, Podbean, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or any of those, you can find us on the Nothing But Net channel. Also check out FiveReasonSports.com, spell it out, F-I-V-E, ReasonsSports.com, where you can find all of our free local South Florida sports content. We've got a cool series. Uh, Martin Bater uh, has been doing a series about forgotten Heat players. He just did one on Wayne Simeon, another one in the queue on Ricky Davis. So check out some of that stuff if you're an old Heat head uh, to find out what happened to some of these people who uh, probably could have had better careers with the Heat. He's asked me if he should do Smush Parker. I don't know that Smush is necessarily the direction we want to go. Also check out all the other podcasts that are there. Three Yards Per Carry, Five Rings, Canes, Balls, Cast, Light Skin, Opinions, Shulable, and more. And our YouTube channel, which just cleared 3,500 subscribers, so a bunch of new shows there, and you should definitely check that. Also, check out our sponsors, Biscayne Bay Brewing. This is a popular one. It's the official craft beer of Inner Miami and the Miami Marlins. It's also South Florida's actual independent brewery, and it's now the official brewery of Five Reasons Sports. We're planning on having some watch parties with these guys once everything sort of clears out again. But Biscayne Bay is owned by local guys who employ people in this community to make their beer right here in South Florida. They're going to have, they're going to be based in downtown Miami, walking distance from the arena soon. So you, you don't think we're going to have some pregames and postgames? These guys are committed to our community and support Five Reasons Sports so we can keep bringing you all the local sports content that you can handle. If you care about supporting local business and drinking amazing beer, grab their stuff, whether it's Marlins Lager, Miami Pale Ale, Tropical Bay, IPA at all major retailers throughout South South Florida. It is the beer that we drink at Five Reasons Sports. I, I'm using past tense because I got to get Alf some more because I'm sure he's finished his already. And now, today's episode. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a Miami Heat and NBA podcast from Ethan Skolnick with Alvon Sydney, aka Alf954. Brought to you by the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, Ethan Skolnick back. Um, something a little bit different on five on the floor, and I'm going to get to the floor plan in a second. You know, we're going to we're going longer these days. Um, part of that is because we're trying to accommodate uh, Dash Radio, and they they need us for a full hour. And so for that reason, at times there won't be like all three or four of us on an episode at a time. It'll be split up a little bit. Usually I'll be here, uh, but with someone else, someone else may join us later. So on this episode, I'm going to start with Greg Sylvander. Uh, today's floor plan is basically, we're going to go through everything that's been happening in the bubble. And a lot of it could indirectly affect the Miami Heat, but the Heat did not practice or have any Zoom calls today. That resumes on Tuesday. And so we'll obviously uh, try to bring you some sound and everything and, and post some stuff up on our YouTube channel. We're also going to introduce our new segment, which is based off a series on our website called Guts Check, which is Greg Sylvander. So, Greg, thank you for joining us. You ready for us? We'll get to five things here, one of which is going to be your Guts Check. Ready for number one? Let's do it. All right. We're going to start in the Western Conference. The big news today was Russell Westbrook has uh, announced on his Twitter account, actually, that he's tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, this was not a huge surprise to you because we've talked for a while about how Houston – had some issues, but they didn't yeah. really get out publicly, right? Like they, they never really leaked. It, it, it's been really actually pretty surprising to, to see what hasn't leaked of the news. And even some of that can even be tied back to the heat, but particularly Houston. Um, what I had heard, um, it may be approaching 10 days ago. I don't know that all the days are running together was that, um, that there was some scuttle that the that the facility may have closed um and i was not able to confirm that so um you know who knows you know it was kept private but for the most part it was because of some positive tests today in light of the R russell westbrook news there's um you know even been some kind of uh people are saying under their breath james harden could be included i've heard some of that as well but it's still unconfirmed uh that, that's a it's a pretty big deal. I think those are probably two of the bigger names um, and particularly as they were set to embark upon the bubble to stay back. Both players did stay back. That was reported. Um, it, it, it just it, this is one of the more high profile situations I think we'll see. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how those guys get integrated and, and, and back with the team. 
Well, if you put together an all COVID team right now, um, you probably win a championship, right? Uh, you, I mean, who, who'd you have Harden? Oh, well, we don't know Harden for sure. And I don't want to jump the gun because I was careful not to jump the gun with the heat, but there is a lot of chatter out there on social media. And it's something that I had heard as well. But I mean, if you looked at, at, at Harden and Westbrook, bam, I mean, who, who am I missing? Who else is Dinwiddie tested positive, right? Um, I mean, these are just some of the ones that have leaked, uh, you know, Durant, <laughs> even though he wasn't going to play, uh, it's a pretty significant list. I, I think that this freaks people out again, cause it's a name, uh, because you know, everybody's concerned about the bubble, but what I'm trying, what, what Alf and I and others have tried to say is the NBA expected a certain number of positive tests and everything I've been told is that the numbers are lower than they expected. Um, they thought there were going to be more. I mean, even on the call, Michelle Robertson, the call I was on that, you know, with a bunch of media, Michelle Robertson and Adam Silver basically made it sound like this is, this is like a dream scenario compared to what they thought it could be. Um, yeah. I, I, I guess the issue becomes because we've seen two MLS teams uh, basically have to, you know, not participate in a bubble in Orlando. Um, and the MLS rules are not as strict as the NBA rules. And I guess that becomes the issue is, you know, if there start to become these positive tests in the bubble that spread through one team, how far does it have to go before they shut it down? And I don't think there's any way they'll shut it down, honestly, Leif, without a death. I, I just, I, I, I think th- they're so all in on that. I, I mean, I don't mean to be light about it, but like they're so far all in on this thing yeah. that it's not stopping uh, unless there's something, someone, and they don't really have anybody who's been sick yet. That's the other thing, right? Like was Gobert sick? Was I, was mm, not, not that I recall. I, I think that the only guy that's had complications that I can remember off the top of my head and I could be wrong and I'm not tracking this is Dinwiddie, right? Yeah. Dinwiddie has had complications and was trying to get back from it. And, and part of now, now is he coming back in? Cause I don't even know. Like they, he, he tweeted about how he could play. Of course the Nets have basically grabbed every player off the street because they don't have a full roster. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he's going in and um, you know, it, it, you're so right in that. Like when you think about what it's going to take for this, machine to stop churning forward and it, there's a little bit of um it, it feels kind of dirty to even have to think that it would take a death to get there but there's so much money involved and um these you know everybody's kind of locked in on getting through and seeing this through that i think it would take a rampant spread or or somebody getting in the hospital and it's sad to see um i mean it's just another example of kind of the dollar driving things. And, uh, and th- that's a tough pill to swallow. It's tough to talk about. Um, but you know, obviously it looks like the show is going on regardless. Yeah. I, I think it, it ha- I think from their view, um, they see it as it has to, and however they want to justify it, whether it's, you know, Adam Silver's view that the NBA kind of let us out of, you know, everybody watching sports on TV and they want to lead us back in. I I just think, and they they also there is a certain arrogance, and I think with the NBA it's earned that they feel that they protect their players better than any other league does, and they want a chance to prove it. Um, but like I said, once somebody gets sick, that's going to be the question. Once it spreads to three or four players, they're hoping to mitigate that. Um, but we're already seeing some players are acting kind of stupid. I mean, the stuff in the bubble is fun. We're going to talk about Ben Simmons and the fishing and, you know, Myers Leonard shotgunning Coors Lights somehow in half a second. Uh, all of that stuff is cool and it's fun. But then didn't somebody, somebody had to leave for 10 days, right? Because they decided to go pick up food. Um, I saw that today. It wasn't Kelly Oubre, even though he threw it out on Twitter. Shh, the Postmates driver can get in if you go the right direction or whatever. But there was somebody today. Oh, Rashawn Smith, I think it was. I'll have to check it. But Well, uh, there was also the Rockets forward, Bruno uh, Oh yeah, Cab- Bruno. Cab- Cabasillo. I yes. think I'm saying it correctly. I could be completely botching that name, but he, in- he inadvertently broke quarantine and now he has to stay in his room for eight days and stay you know away from the team completely. So that was widely reported. Um, so there's going to be more and more of those slip ups and, and hopefully it's a lot of inadvertent, innocent stuff. But mm. unfortunately, uh, if we take the blinders off, it's hard to see that there's not going to be a little bit of um, 
of maybe some bending of the rules. And that's where this gets dicey because if you see a team in the midst of a playoff run, I've said this from the first podcast that I did related to this whole entire um, season resuming, like, could you imagine the NBA finals and LeBron and AD all of a sudden test positive and have to sit out in game three? Like, it's like the, like to think that that's even possible um, on that stage, uh, it's definitely a gut check. <laughs> no, no doubt. No, no doubt. And, and it is possible. And that's the thing. The deeper they get into this, the harder it is for them to dig out of it. And, uh, you know, I get that. And let's, let's transition to number two then because you mentioned two Lakers. Uh, the second thing I wanted to get into here was one guy who was making fun of the accommodations was Rajan Rondo, comparing it to a Motel 6 and posting this on, on his social media. And now he's out motel six to eight weeks. Um, he's sorry. Nobody laughed at that joke on Twitter, uh, but, uh, he, he's, he's out six to eight weeks. Um, the funny thing about this one to me is that, uh, if they hadn't already lost, uh, Avery Bradley, right. Uh, you know, because uh, he chose not to play because he has a, a son who's susceptible. And so he decided to stay home, which I totally understood. But if they hadn't already lost him, um, I, I would have think, I would think, you know, he, losing his old Celtics, you know, backcourt mate Rondo, who hurt the Lakers when he was on the floor this year badly. Okay. I mean, he was a plus for every team that was playing the Lakers would actually be a good thing for the Lakers to lose him but they're thinner in the backcourt. But let's get to the real issue here. They already brought in J.R. Smith. They've got Caruso, who is Bleacher Report believes is the best player in the league. Um, uh. But we know who's going to get the touches now, right? I mean, ostensibly, the point guard of the, uh, of the Los Angeles Lakers is going to end up being Deion Waiters, no? It has to be. I mean, at least he can create and he's going to be, um, he's going to have the definitely the P the playing time to, to make that happen. I thought it was funny how quickly, um, our friend of the show, Mario Chalmers name got brought up and then, uh, you know, he brought up his own name. He brought up his own name. Exactly. Right. Um, he, he, he's, he's quick to do that. And I, I would understand why, but, um, then I read that, the, the Lakers are unable to bring in a substitute player for some reason that I some quirk in the rules that I haven't right. necessarily gone dug out yet. So, so that kind of put the, you know, Mario Chalmers is not viable. So you're right. It's like, who else is it going to be? It's going to be Caruso, which that's not going to last in a playoff series. He'll get picked on in my opinion. Um, so it's going to be a guy like Dion who at least can get back some of what he loses on defense when he plays, you know, on the offensive end. And one thing we've talked about with Dion is he's had months now to get himself in shape and would seem to be, I mean, if he's ever going to be motivated again, we did see the last time Dion was motivated, which was on a one year, $2.7 million contract with the heat. He balled out. So it's in him. Um, I don't know that he makes you better from an efficiency standpoint. Then he's going to drive LeBron nuts. I mean, I've told this many, many times that, you know, when LeBron basically traded Dion for J.R. Smith, it was perceived as less trouble to bring in J.R. Smith. Uh, so it was, it was considered addition by subtraction. But I, I guess LeBron sees more appreciation for him now. But, I mean, if you look at that team, man, like that is uh, – you know, it's funny. We talk about that first Heat team, the 10-11 the team, right, and the expectations. But when you really broke down the roster and then started – guys like Miller and Haslam started to get hurt – it really wasn't that good a team. Like, no, not at, at all. At, at the top, it was great, right? But it really wasn't that good a team. Uh, not, not championship worthy, really. All right. The, this Laker team, in the same sense, is really not that. Now that they've lost some pieces, right? They're even like, thinner. yeah, it, they're it's thinner. Even I mean, right. I mean, and again, Rondo was not a plus, but Avery Bradley was. Um, and they were counting on Demarcus Cousins to give him something. And that didn't end up happening. Now, Dwight's been, I think, a little bit better than they anticipated. But if you really break down that team, like it, it reminds me a lot of that Heat team. Like, okay, Kuzma is your third option. That's not as good as Bosch. Um, you know, maybe, you know, LeBron, you had prime LeBron and prime Wade at that point. You've got older, smarter, smarter, more mentally tough LeBron, but not as athletic. Anthony Davis at this stage and Dwayne Wade at that stage – in my view, is pretty comparable, right? Like Dwayne hadn't fallen apart physically yet. So, I mean, they yeah. were about 
Dwayne was a little older than AD is now, right? But only by a couple of years. Um, no, they, they're pretty close in impact. And I think teams game plan for them in similar ways in terms of how much they had to load up and stuff like that. But, you know, to think about the Lakers having to rely on Danny Green essentially playing at levels that he only plays at against the Heat. Yeah. Um, that, that's uh, that, that's a t- tough order to go through an entire playoffs kind of because with Kuzma I feel like it's that's just an offensive thing so it's like Danny Green is going to need to um, plug holes in, in places where I don't think that they necessarily thought that he was going to have to and that's a lot to rely on well I, I trust him more than I trust Kuzma I don't trust Kuzma at all I, I, I need to, I need to see it I mean the, the third option role on a on a championship level team is one of the hardest roles to fill in the sport um, you know, we saw Kevin, you know, you know, again, I had the conversations with Bosch about it before Kevin Love tried it. Glenn Rice really struggled with it, with the Lakers. People forget that. Okay. I mean, to the point that his, his new wife was complaining about Phil Jackson to the media for Glenn, not getting enough touches out there. Like it didn't always go well for him. Eddie Jones tried to be it for the Lakers. I mean, there's a long list of guys, the third option role, is is tough. I mean, Golden State. The re- one of the reasons I think it worked so well was Draymond was a third option who didn't want the ball. You yeah. know, it it, be- it became different when Durant came in, obviously, and then Clay, his natural personality. I mean, you know, <laughs> let's just say Clay. You know, I, I'm not going to say it anyway. I won't say it. But Clay, Clay, Clay would like Dutch Valley Farms. Um, Clay's laid back. Okay, he's very laid. He's known as one of the most laid back guys in the whole league. And so, like him settling into a third option, that's why everybody says, "Well, if Clay was a first option, Clay doesn't want to be a first option. He he hasn't right. want he hasn't and not like Harden did, right? But then, even if you look at OKC, like Harden was supposed to be the third option on the OKC team, you know, with Durant and Westbrook, not a comfortable. I mean, he did it well in the regular season. He bombed in the finals against the Heat. It's difficult. Kuzma has the total wrong mentality for it. Yeah. Total. I mean, you might as well have Michael Beasley trying to be the third option in some ways. Right. And I know that I'm being extreme there for dramatic effect, but there, there's like a similarity, I think, in certain ways in terms of that you need the third guy to, to do certain glue things. And that's why Chris Bosh, the way that he evolved in his role was particularly intriguing to watch because, I mean, we watched Jamal Mashburn struggle yes. with that role for years. So I think Kuzma is kind of similar to Mashburn in those ways. Um, and so that's just another thing, but you know what? I still have a hard time betting against LeBron. I'm just conditioned to not bet against that guy. No. And I understand. And I think that the Clippers have some structural issues. And, and again, I, is Lou Williams there by the way? Did he, did he go? I, I haven't heard that he's not. And I think that we would have heard that. We would so have I'm heard it. Guessing, right? but I, I, so I'm, I'd imagine he's there, but I haven't seen him in any footage. Cause he's really important to them. But I, look, I, I like, uh, you know, with Harrell and with Beverly, I mean, they've got a good mix of players there. And I've made the case that they benefited more from this than the Lakers, even though LeBron got to rest his legs, because now you've got Paul George and Kawhi can go full speed ahead the entire time where they were not doing that during the regular season. Paul George was not great this regular season, not as good as he, he was last year. In my view, um, I think that he and Kawhi need to kind of figure that out a little bit. I'm with you about the not betting against LeBron, but again, I look at the rest of this roster. I mean, they, these guys they're picking up off the street, they're not like plugging them in. Like they're going to have to rely on them. Like they have to rely on Dion now. They have to rely to a certain extent on JR because your other guys, I mean, you're relying on KCP to continue the hot streak he had with a month left in the, in the season because he was awful for for first two months you know yeah i mean one of these guys that they're gonna rely on is inevitably gonna pull a mike bibby in a playoff series and Mm -hmm. that's a tough thing to and we've seen it i mean we've seen prime lebron have a tough time getting over that um so uh what you know it's it's gonna be an interesting interesting thing to watch unfold because you know this is a year that i think lebron more than anyone sees it as an opportunity to get another ring and um so i think that that was why he was such a proponent of getting back in that bubble Yes, no, there's no doubt. I, if, and I also think, and, and look, we may not want to say it, but if, if the Lakers were in the position they were the year before, I don't know that the NBA pushes as hard. I know they need the money, but a lot of this is about crowning LeBron. It's about c- continuing that narrative. I, I hate to say it, but that, Adam Silver and LeBron are tight. I'm not, if this isn't a David Stern, you know, cooking it up to make sure Patrick Ewing goes to the Knicks kind of conspiracy. Frozen envelope. Frozen envelope, right. They still didn't get a title. So, I, you know, the saddest thing was when I realized how old I am and how pathetic the Knicks have been, and again, I grew up a Knicks fan, 
was the uh, one of those you know Twitter sites, Content NBA maybe put it out. So what was the team that won a championship the year you were born? And I was like the the Knicks. Uh, that's that wow. that's not a good feeling because that <laughs> it tells you how old I am and also uh, which one for you by the way. 1982. So I'm going to say that that was probably the Lakers, but I can't remember. Oh, I, I think, well, no, well, the Sixers were 83. It was either the Lakers or the Celtics. The Lakers. I, I, I think it was the Lakers it. beat Houston, right? Is that right? Um, this is funny that we're going down this rabbit hole. They beat the Sixers. They did beat the Sixers and the Sixers came back and won the next year. That's right. With Moses. That's right. Yeah. Magic yeah, Johnson, they, the finals MVP. Alf's right. best favorite player. <laughs> yeah, I think they made a. Uh, I think they is that when they made the Dawkins Moses Malone trade. I think they might have something like that. So but yeah, basically they ended up with Moses. The, and, the kids and have now football. tuned out of this podcast. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, no, Alex has would have no idea what we're talking about. All right, let's get to number three. Uh, the kids will be more interested in this. Uh, we've seen him fishing on that NBA bubble Twitter account, which is kind of funny. Um, but you know, the other thing we're seeing is that Ben Simmons, apparently, according to Brett Brown is working totally off ball right now at the four um, instead of at point guard. Could you please tell me who's playing point guard for the Sixers right now? Cause I feel like I know the league and I didn't know the name. Shake Milton. And I would have to go to Nikias to get the breakdown for, for Shake <laughs> Milton. No, I, you know, he did have actually some good minutes this year, but I think it's, it, it has to be pointed out particularly from, um, team petty heat fan that uh there is a hundred million dollar player named al horford that now appears to be coming off the bench and yes. uh, unfortunately for for heat fans we know what it feels like to have a hundred million dollar big man coming off the bench and i think horford will probably accept it in a different way but it just shows that that kind of the way they approach that off season, it just further clouds why they did what they did and why they went away from Jimmy the way that they did. Cause uh, they're essentially not trying to build a smaller roster now that they had anyway. So um, mm-hmm. definitely an interesting mix, but, but, and I'll, I'm going to shout out Nikias again. He's always said Ben Simmons should play the four. And now yes. I think we're going to get to see that. So uh, that that's another interesting, uh, you know, wrinkle here. Yeah. I think they, they got to the right place, but, they've done too much damage along the way. Like I I think Ben is not a point guard right now. He has point guard skills, but you are too limited offensively with him at that position. You just are, you can't put enough shooting around um, and you can't put enough additional playmaking around him. He's got to play the LeBron role, you know, like the the facilitator. That's the four kind of for the four. And he could do some of it from the post. He does all of his work from inside five feet anyway. Uh, so this is where he belongs. The, the other thing is it puts him closer to Embiid. And now, you know, you're already having, you know, I think one of the parts that's interesting about this to me is that Embiid comes out and says that the offense should go through him. And then basically the ball's being taken out of Ben's hands. So the ball, the offense is going to go through Embiid. I mean, that's, yeah. that, that's where this, this is, is headed. Yeah, no, you're so right. Maybe this is Philadelphia uh, in a way speaking to Embiid because there, mm-hmm. there's been some little bits of, of chatter that like Embiid and Simmons is not going to work long term and right. that eventually they're going to have to make that decision. And some have speculated it would be Embiid because of, you know, maybe some extracurricular stuff that's not always in line with what they want to do. But this may be also a message saying, you know, no, we're going to lean into the big fella and um, and take the ball out of Simmons' hands. We could be reading too much into it because we've heard stuff like this from players before, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, they revert back to what they've always done. But Jimmy was handling. We said this at the la- on I think it was the last episode. Jimmy was closing games as the facilitator, and now mm-hmm. they're putting Shake Milton at point guard. So something ain't adding up there. No, I don't think they went into this season think they would do that. I mean, they had um, – Trey Burke was playing a lot of point guard minutes for them earlier this year. I, I also think we've got to be careful – like buying into too much of what coaches say in the bubble totally. because they're, they're being first thing they don't have the privacy they typically have because they're stuck in a hotel with all these other teams. And this was actually a good question that was asked to Spo the other day. So it's like, I do feel like there's going to be even more deception thrown off from the practices on what teams are actually doing. Like there's no way Spo is going to reveal certain things. He doesn't have to. I mean, we don't get to watch practices in Miami anyway, but it's easier to get, it's not never easy to get information from the heat. Trust me, but it is easier to do it when at least you can see the players and pull a guy to the side than it is now when they're giving us two players on zoom calls every day and everybody gets one question. I mean, I would imagine Spo 
there, there's probably moments that Spo has the lineup card before the game and he waits till just after the oh, buzzer yeah. sounds and then he hands it over. So um, this is an even more controlled environment. And I'm sure that there's certain organizations that like that or, or take advantage of it more than others. Well, it's more controlled from the media, but it's not more controlled from other teams because you're stuck in the same place, which is why I do Good think point. that they're going to tell lies, more lies to the media about what's actually happening because they want that stuff to spread. And so it starts to throw other teams off who may think they heard something about what team's doing, but they're not really doing that. Um, I, I, I do think th they like the control. Now, again, the Heat had Zoom calls, you know, with players. And, you know, one of the very first ones they had this week was with Gora Dragic. And he basically gave away the ghost about Bam and Nunn <laughs> testing positive. So, I mean, you can only tell your players so much. I mean, there is a Heat representative, whether it's Mike Lissack or Tim Donovan or Rob Wilson is going to be on one of those calls. But they're not going to jump in uh, to stop. They can't really do that. You know, jump in to stop it. I mean, they can say we don't, we don't want to take questions on this today. Um, but right now there's really nothing to not take questions on. And so I, I do think that there's going to be some, there's going to be some smoke bombs thrown out there just to divert. Um, and maybe that's what Philly's doing. I, like I said, I think if Simmons is going to play more four, I think they've come to the right place, but look at the damage they did with that roster. I mean, it, it means you're counting on shake Milton to make plays for you down the stretch. We know it's not Jay Rich's game. Um, and then you, you know, and Tobias, I just, you know, I just don't, I don't trust. I, I know that he's made some clutch shots over the years, but I mean, to have him as your max player, go-to player when you can't get the ball into the post to MB late in games or MB's in foul trouble is problematic. It's problematic. Um, you know, it also, the other thing that this does against the heat, let's talk about this quickly. And then I want to get to the Oladipo stuff, which is part four today. Lineup wise against the Heat, it does Philly's big advantage supposedly over a lot of teams was their size. Yeah. Well, now you're taking Horford out, you're putting Milton in. You've just lost what eight inches, <laughs> right? Um, and and the Heat went big against them this year. So let me throw this at you: if the if Philly comes in with a starting lineup of Ben at the four and Milton at point with what Harris, Jay Rich, and Embiid. Do the Heat not start Myers in that scenario? Do they start Jay Crowder, DJJ, somebody else at the four, put Bam at the five because basically that person's going to be guarding Ben? Hmm, that's an interesting question because you know I've, I'm looking at Shake Milton and um, and that's funny that we're st this should be the Shake Milton podcast. Um, he's played 19 minutes a game and on basically three attempts, three point attempts, he's shooting 45%. So um, they, they did add an element of shooting there in, in, cer in certain ways. But I think that the Heat are the type of team that will probably stick with the lineup that they're most comfortable with. Um, I, I don't see them necessarily tweaking a ton from a starting lineup perspective, mm. but sizing down 100%. And the other wrinkle that was huge against Philly this year, we saw that the literally the landscape changed against that team was when that zone Mm -hmm. um, kind of threw them off and they kept going back to it and they have that in their back pocket. I think it's particularly useful against Philly and it'll be interesting to see if that can still be deployed with the same effectiveness when they've kind of gone in a completely different direction from a size perspective. Well, the other thing you could do, I'm just looking at the matchups. I mean, I guess you could start Bam on Ben, right? That's true. Bam can guard anyone. That's Unbelievable. I, Rob, I mean, that's what you would do because Myers was playing the minutes against Embiid anyway, right? So yeah. most of them, uh, un, until some of them that matter, Myers was off the floor. So you'd start him on – then you basically play in Jimmy on Tobias, which was what you were doing before. Duncan on Jay Rich, I guess, and Nunn on Milton. Again, I'm assuming Bam and Nunn being back and the starting lineup being the same. But you can match up that way. Um, You're right. And, and in, in some ways – I don't know. It's, it's a little more comfortable, I guess, um, because none, the, the problem before was there wasn't anybody for none to guard except Jay Rich. And, and I, I remember one of the, the games against Philly, Jay Rich was cooking him early. Yeah. Um, and then I think Gorn can also struggle with some of that too. So this gives another guy that, that, and even Tyler, right. Um, so, so it, I think that it's opened up a lot of different things from a matchup perspective that helped the heat actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but 
ultimately it's, uh, you know, the one part of this, like with Kelly Olynyk, that, that, that's a guy that I feel like in an Embiid series, Kelly Olynyk could probably fall to the background. But in this scenario where maybe Embiid's minutes are primarily against Myers Leonard and Myers Leonard gets more minutes in that kind of series, maybe Olynyk can find a role because it's not necessarily that he has to get matched up against Embiid for, for too many, too long of stretches. Right. You could play him against Horford. I think exactly. Possibly. I, I think I think you'd be okay with that. I do think it's interesting because I think this is about Philadelphia, like you say. I think it's, it's somehow catering to Embiid, but also trying to unlock Simmons. Uh, so I, I get why they do it for them, but I actually think it could play into the Heat's hands in a potential series. And it doesn't mean they stay with it. But the other thing is, if, if they're abandoning the Horford Embiid thing, I don't know how they get out of it. I mean, I, they're stuck with that contract, and like you said, Al is not. Whiteside, Al is not going to complain now. Anna Horford might on Twitter. Uh, right, <laughs> Al, Al, Al is she's outspoken, but Al is not the type. I mean, Al is a pro, uh, but it was just a terrible fit from the beginning. I mean, this was an Elton Brand kind of overreach, and one of the things I, I think that's problematic for some GMs who played. And Elton's a very smart guy. If you ever communicated with Elton, he's very bright. I think he has a plan. You know, he's the third GM there. You know, in recent times, <laughs> and every one of them has had a different vision which has created problems. But I think if you look at with, with Elton, I think Elton kind of sees himself in Horford. And I think that was problematic. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that, that, um, I mean, Elton Brand and Horford are kind of carbon copies of each other as they winded down their careers. But the, the thing with Horford that kind of is a good part for the Sixers. And I hate to say this is that, he does have the kind of leadership qualities and certain intangible things that will make another contending team take a, ch- take a chance on him if they have to. So um, I think they'll ultimately, if they decide that this is what needs to happen, they'll be able to move him. But for this particular run, it definitely it, it doesn't make much sense. All right. So Horford's deal, what is it? So Horford um, is in the first year of a four-year deal that expires in 2023. Um, but it is one of those deals where the highest cap hit is this first season, um, you know, 28 million, and then it goes down from there to 26.5. So it's just another reason why I think that they'll be able to find a suitor if they have to go in that direction. But man, 2023 until they get that relief, that's tough. Well, and again, it was done basically, you know, the justification was we got rid of Jimmy. We're going we're gonna to keep Tobias at a max, and we're going to bring in Horford and Jay Rich. We're going to be better overall. But it's one of those things. When, you, when you're trying to put too many pieces together on a team at the same time, like high talent pieces, it's tough to make it all fit right away. And the problem is I feel like this Philly team has a shorter timeline than young teams typically do because everybody knows that there's issues with Embiid and Simmons. So it's like, yep. okay, we got to make the, you know, with other it's young tick, teams, tick, you can kind of wait, right. It's <laughs> ticking. Right. But like with this team, it's kind of like, all right, if we don't, and, and I've never seen a team that came into Miami over the past couple of years that looked as miserable as the Sixers. I mean, the one blowout game here, but also like Jay Rich, like if you, if you were around Josh Richardson, in Miami, He was always positive. I mean, from the very beginning, like I remember having conversations with him when he was a rookie not playing. I would end up at the same airport as him a lot because he'd be flying, you know, to meet Sioux Falls in various places, like with his his hoodie on because he didn't want people to recognize him. Like that was him the first year. Like nobody really talked to him in the locker room. He hadn't been to New York City in his life. Like there was all everything was new for him. And but he was always positive, always smiling. Um, very, yeah. very likable, right? Like versatile. The coolest industry. dude at shoot arounds. Like the, the dude oh, yeah. that was most willing to sit there and have a conversation with you and totally engage. Um, yeah. Was well, definitely. We, he, he was at the top of the list. When we had him at, uh, we had him at media day last year. Um, cause when, when the heat beat guys were down there with me and Jay Rich, just, he wanted to keep coming back. Like he, he did 15 minutes. He wanted to come back. Can I come on the show again? Um, you know, he was, you know, he's talking FIFA and piano and all the different things that he does. He's just got, he's got eclectic interests. He's an interesting guy. He looked like a ghost of himself when he was here with Philly this year, like miserable, like, and they were looking to him for leadership just cause he came from here and like that was never Josh's role here, you know. It was, it was just he was just the cool guy to have around, you know, and n- not to have to take that kind of a role. 
And so I, I do feel like there's, there's like a, and look, the clock's ticking on him too. I mean, he can get out of there. Yeah. Um, you know, and, right. And I mean, he, well, boy, would he be a nice fit with this heat team right now? Um, to think about it. I mean, there's a lot of roles he could play for Miami. So I, I just think that, you know, you look at Philly, they got to get something going now. And the Horford thing uh, is the biggest problem. And the only positive they have is he's a good dude who's probably not going to make a big issue, but it's still, uh, it's still not ideal. All right, we're going to get to a couple more topics here. And at some point, Alex might join us as well. But I want to tell you about another of the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network, and that is Making America Clean Again. No, it's not that other thing. It's M-A-C-A. It's a division of Greenview Construction and Restoration, our guy Chris Tyson. And this specializes in the cleanup of contaminated areas. And you need that right now because obviously we're going through COVID. So you need to get those certificates to show whether it's in bacterial, viral, fungi, or mold cleaning treatments that your place is clean and safe, whether it's your business, whether it's your residence. They clean, they sanitize, they disinfect, and they sterilize. And the process can be short-term or long term, they will work with you. The website is macainc.net. That's M A C A I N C.net. Again, that's a division of Greenview Construction and Restoration called Making America Clean Again. Check it out again. A lot of our sponsors have to do with COVID, they're locally based, but we're trying to expose you to some sponsors that can really help you deal with the new normal. And this is the new normal, as we know today. Uh, Florida had 13,000, I believe, more cases after 15,000 the day before. So this isn't going anywhere. Life's going to be different. Make sure you reach out to MaccaInc.net. Or maybe, listen, maybe it's not your business, but you want to impress the boss. Give the boss a good idea, okay? Reach out to Chris. MaccaInc.net. All right, let's, uh, let's get to two more parts of this. We have written off Victor Oladipo, right? Like, Victor Oladipo was not going to play this year. He was uh, going to the bubble to be with his teammates, but basically resting his knee that he, he's been rehabilitating. He also seems to be suggesting through some kind of sources, and we've talked about this on Five on the Floor before, um, Jay Michael, who covers the team up there in Indiana, is a very good reporter. I've known him a long time. Has basically you know, hinted that Victor's not so happy. We know about the interest in Miami. What do you make of the report today that he may try to play? I think that when you're around your teammates like this and as particularly if he has, as Shams reported, um, had some inspired practices where he's looked really good. I think when you're in that space and then you start to think about, well, I'm going to be in this bubble anyway, there's a competitive part of Victor Oladipo, which why this is, this is what makes him an attractive Miami heat type player is the fact that there's, um, a part of him that is, uh, super competitive and probably is around his teammates and just can't necessarily come to grips with the fact that he's going to sit on the sidelines if he looks as good as they're saying he looks and if he feels good. So I think that that's probably what's driving this a little bit. And I know we had our conspiracy theorists out there saying that, you know, him sitting had to do with saving himself for his next destination, wherever that may be. But um, ultimately, uh, we've talked about the Heat getting the chance to evaluate Oladipo to make an investment from a free agent perspective, but this is also a chance for Indiana to get an idea of what kind of team this is and how far they can go with a healthy Oladipo. They can see how healthy he is. So um, I, I think ultimately it'll be a positive thing, but there is um, – from the Heat's perspective, you maybe were aiming for that Indiana matchup and there were ways that maybe you could manipulate seeding by the teams that you faced. Uh, and now that might not be the most, uh, you know, smart, or you may just not, you, there's no draw that's easier than the other if you're, you know, playing a fully healthy Pacers team. Yeah, and I do wonder, you talk about the pull of the, the good, I didn't even think he was going to practice with them. So that was, I mean, I know he was traveling with them, but I thought if you're shutting down the knee, you're shutting it down. I thought maybe rehab on the side, ride the bike, that kind of thing. But I didn't realize he's going to be going full bore with them. I think if he's come this far, he's probably going to play. I also wonder, you know, Vic's a good dude. I think if, you, if you've encountered Vic, he's very likable. Um, he probably doesn't like a lot of the talk that's out there right now. It doesn't reflect all that well on him locally with Indiana, which is a place that obviously he's got some history uh, totally. and, and, and has embraced him. And I, I don't know, even if he is planning on getting out of there, if he wants to end on a sour note, if that's Not what ends up happening. 
Right. So, so I think that, you know, it makes sense. And also, look, you know, we talked, we've joked about how there seems to be this battle between him and Bradley Beal to see who can get to Miami. I mean, maybe even Brad, Bradley Beal's not playing, right? Maybe Vic, Vic is. Vic shows the heat something. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to think Vic's a better offensive player than Bradley Beal because to me there's only like three or four guys in the league who are. Uh, but Vic offers something defensively that Beal hasn't offered in the past couple of years at least. And if you, you know, if he shows he's at full strength, uh, maybe, you know, that encourages the Heat to make a move for him sooner instead of waiting for 21. I'm not sure. Or maybe, like I said, maybe he just wants to be around his teammates. A- anything's possible, but I do think it changes the equation a little bit. I think as we talk about the two most likely first round opponents, whether it's Indiana or Philadelphia, you know, both are in turmoil in different ways. And, you know, whether Vic played or not, there's an adjustment made because, you know, the Pacers played pretty well without Vic this year, but didn't play that well without Vic and Brogdon. And now you're trying to get the two of them back together on the same page. And meanwhile, we talk about Philadelphia putting Simmons at the four where they're going to potentially, again, if it's true, going to play completely differently. Um, You know, the Heat have more of a kind of a known quantity. I know that they don't know exactly how Myers and Tyler are going to fit with Iguodala and Crowder because they didn't really play together. But they kind of know what their group looks like overall. You know, they know what people will fill what roles. They know you know, who their late game player is going to be, although Jimmy's got to be better in those situations than he was, particularly kind of second half of the season. They know the offense is going to run through Bam. They know that their shooting is going to come from Duncan and Tyler and Goron. Like, they, they know certain things. I, I don't know that there's as much known with Indiana. I don't no, know the that pe- there's the, as the much pieces known don't with Philly. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. The pieces don't fit in the same way, um, you know, like, even if all the depot and Brogdon are at full strength, they still don't know if Sabonis and Turner fit next to each other. So that's a whole other element of, of the pieces not fitting that um, is unlike what the heat go into this having. Alex is uh, Alex is with us. Um, we were talking, we, we've talked already about Westbrook, about Rondo, about Simmons at the four for Philly. We're kind of on the topic four now, um, which is about all the depot. Are, are you surprised that he may try to play now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was kind of a plot twist. I wasn't necessarily expecting that. Uh, has there been any reporting at all behind why he's doing this? I mean, I think, what was it like? Just that he basically wanted to spend, uh, I mean, well, he had good practices. The practices yeah, that he's heard. had some inspired practices that have him leaning in the direction of playing, something like that. It's not as articulate as that, but they said that he's been fully participating in all the five-on-five scrimmages, and there's a lot of optimism about his playing status. Um, that was about two hours ago that um, – that was reported. I right, got some some FOMO. Is that is that what it is? You got fear of missing out, right? Is that what it, you know it what? could be. You, you you're about twenty years young on me for that. I have never heard that one before. What, what really? That? Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I mean that's, that's an old one too. I feel like that's like a that's like older than me. Like that well, phrase. Then that's ingrained in every Twitter user because that's the whole reason why you pick up your phone and scroll on it over and over because you don't oh, want to yeah. miss the, the latest news. So that's God, God, really so prevalent. With so, I mean, I've already given away, Alex, on this pod that I was born the year the Knicks last won a title. Um, so yeah. I mean, I've already I've already given away my age, but I, I did not uh, I did not know that. There's another one that the um, God. There's another three three letter. Oh, it'll come to me now. I just forgot it because again, I'm old. But there's another. There's like a three letter. Uh, LOL actor. is laugh out loud. No, I know what LOL is. My daughter uses that with me. I know what LOL is, okay? All right, we're going to do this before we get to – I'm going to let Alex catch up on the basketball. We've got a few more minutes to go here. When do you choose – because I've got certain people who use LOL. Like, you know who uses LOL? Eric Spolstra. Um, there's hmm. certain people who use LOL, and there are certain people who use LMAO. I use both. You use – no, Alex uses LMAO all the time. Yeah, yeah, All the yeah, time. yeah, yeah. What, what what is what is this? Is one it's, older than the other? No, I think they both come from like what, the, you know, early internet, maybe two thousand, early two thousands. Uh, you know, later computer than that. talk, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel maybe like texting when when texting first started. Right, I I feel like I'll do, like LOL is okay, um, in some professional set, settings. 
LMAO is what you do like towards your friends or something like that. Like there's, that's where the line so is. So it's a just less because, formal, it's a less correct, formal. Which LOL. is totally ridiculous that any of this gets formal in any capacity, but that is kind of, I guess the, the line that I've drawn in the artificial imaginary line of sand here. <laughs> you, you know, which one I finally figured out. I, I, this is going to be so embarrassing. This is literally taking me 10 years in, into uh, to abbreviating stuff. I finally figured out what HMU is. I'm like, I, I just, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I find I say, wish we'll Alf see was here on this episode. I, I finally because because my daughter used it with me. Seriously. Okay. My six year old. She's six next week. Okay. She's already wow. using these expressions. I finally figured I don't know where she picked it up from, but I mean Tyler, Tyler Hero. That's Tyler Hero with you. He's using it Well, yeah, it worked for <laughs> Tyler Hero. Okay. Obviously. He hit someone up. Um that worked that worked out just fine. All right, Alex, we're gonna go through some basketball topics and then we're gonna get you just you caught just in time for the first guts check here. Um but let's let's get oh, to these man. let's get to you to these quickly with you. Um Westbrook being out quickly significance. Um, well, it's terrible. It sucks that any of these players get COVID, honestly, and obviously. And it seems like Arden also has it. There's there's some reporters that are maybe not, you know, Woj or Shams, who we just take as fact, but there's some stuff going around Twitter that uh Harden and Russ both got it, and that's why they haven't traveled with the team to Orlando. And it's obviously terrible. It seems like just like the Heat guys are probably going to be back just around the time for the beginning of the restart. And again, this whole thing is just, it's hard to talk about because we don't really know the long-term effects of the human body. I'm sure, you know, it probably varies depending on the, the person, but at the same time, it's like, I, I don't know what else to say about it other than it's terrible just because we really don't know much else about it other than a lot of people get it really bad. Some get it better than others. And at the end of the day, it sucks that these guys got to go through that. And then now, got to play in a high stakes basketball environment is going to be well, the other thing, tough. Well, the other thing about it is, I mean, this is a guy who goes a hundred miles an hour um, all the time. Oh yeah. So and Arden, I mean, we mentioned before. Has asthma issues. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. And, and you know, it's funny too. He lost because, a lot of weight too. Well, right. He lost a lot of weight. Now I don't want to assume that it had anything to do with COVID, but if he, if he is, basically at a different weight than he was before his body might be affected differently. Who knows? I don't know what kind of transformations he's gone through over the past few months. So it is something to monitor. All right. Number two, does losing Rajon Rondo, uh, Mr. Motel six for close to two months, he's going to have to quarantine after, you know, if he, after he heals, um, does that help or hurt the Lakers? I mean, I don't want to be too mean and say that it helps the Lakers, but I don't think it hurts them too much is what I will say. Uh, you know, I think Rondo's main usage now in this in this NBA is just being maybe a solid backup point guard who can kind of run pick and roll with a big who, who can't really do much. That's why I think like maybe him and Dwight off the bench was maybe a solid thing for them just because of that. I think Dwight and and Rondo those are ba basically what they what they're good at, right? Like on offense, it's just basically running the pick and roll with Rondo as a as the handler and Dwight as a roller. And other than that, I think they'll be fine because even though they still lost Bradley, they still have other guys of that caliber like Contavious Caldwell Pope and Alex Caruso. They signed Dion. Dion. They signed Jr. I mean, just They'll get to fine. the guy who matters, man. Just get to the guy. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I didn't even think about that in in that aspect. Of it. I mean, they lost Bradley and Rondo, so Dion and Jr. could both kind of fit into those because they were both playing. They were both rotation guys for them. So I think we're actually going to see this. I'm pretty excited now. What could well, go wrong? What 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 could go wrong with the? What answer? won't go right? <laughs> right. I mean, it's <laughs> when, when I think it's when an upgrade. The, if we're being serious here, uh, well, it is an upgrade. I I, I don't R Rondo can't to me. Rondo, like this is proof again. Dion is better than Rondo. That's for sure. No, I think he is better than Rondo if he's if he's if he's, if he's at the right weight. Um, but wow. this is proof again that you cannot. Well, it's just reality. I mean, he's. I mean, if he's if well, you he's can say in that for anybody, Ethan. If he's in condition, if he's in condition. But he, here's the thing about national media guys and why you can't follow them when they uh, talk about the NBA. Colin Coward actually talked today about how this was a crushing blow for the Lakers defense because they lost their two best perimeter defenders. Now, you can make a case for Avery Bradley. Avery Bradley, from a statistical standpoint, um, has been overrated defensively for a while. But you can make an argument. This year. He, right. You can make an argument for Avery Bradley. Rajon Rondo has not been a good defender for years, like almost a decade. Okay. <laughs> like, so just don't at listen least, to Colin Coward talk basketball. At ever. least since like the last 
season or so of when he was on the Celtics. I think that's when he kind of started trailing off. Definitely once he got traded to Dallas because he, he just completely oh gave God. up there. That was just terrible. But uh, He wasn't good in Chicago either. I mean, he has not been a good defender in a well, long Well, he was time. better in Chicago than he was – in Dallas, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, <laughs> and then Sacramento he, and then New Orleans. I forgot about I, Dallas. Oh, I forgot about New Orleans. That's right. He was. In, I. I remember the Sacramento. I mean, oh, he went to like, Dallas. He, he didn't. He, wasn't he fighting with Rick Carlisle? Oh, uh, Rick Carlisle couldn't wait to boot his ass out of there. And if Rick Carlisle is <laughs> not one of those coaches that you're like, okay, it's the coach's fault. Like that was. No. You know, I mean, he said no. All right, let's get to it. The first ever edition of Guts Check. I think everybody needs to get a grip. You got to stay together if you got the guts and you don't find the first door and run out of it. There are no obstacles. There's no obstacles. All there are are accusations and opinions. We have done this since 1995. We'll find out what we're made of here if you got the guts. guts, 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 guts. This is Guts Check with Greg Sylvander. Okay, so... Let's rewind back to December of 2018. Um, I was I had my headphones on and I was listening to a Zach Lowe podcast with Woj and um, and he made a statement. He said, "No, there may not be any NBA team that has a bleaker future than the Miami Heat." This was December of 2018, not too long ago. I know it feels like 500 lifetimes ago with what we've just been enduring, but it wasn't so long ago. Um, so I stumbled upon last week a bleacher bleacher report top 100 player list, and uh, you know I was you know perusing through the list and 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 I started to look through and and at 97 I saw Duncan Robinson, and then I started to think about well how did the Heat acquire Duncan Robinson? Oh wait, he was an undrafted free agent, and then I scrolled down the list a little bit more, and at 26, 26 was Bam Adebayo. And Mm -hmm. well, what do you know it? He was a late lottery pick, not, they didn't need to tank. And then all the way up at number nine was Jimmy Butler. And the funny part about that is, is that he was acquired with no cap space and no assets and no draft picks and, and basically with, with no uh, viable path to get him. And now there's three guys that are in the top 100 uh, per this Bleacher Report article. And they didn't even list Goran Dragic, who I think can arguably be, um, in the neighborhood of Duncan Robinson in the top 100. So I guess I'm saying all that to say that um, no matter what happens in the coming two years, whether it be Oladipo or Beal or Donovan Mitchell or, or the, the pipe dream of Giannis, I think that this is ultimately a really good moment to not only trust the organization, because you know I'm always going to say that and shout it from the rooftops, but let's have fun and watch this particular team because ultimately we see that this can at any moment transform into a championship team. And uh, they're just basically at the launching pad for this thing. So let's enjoy the team as we have it now. And uh, don't doubt the organization. And that's all I have to say about that. All right. The first, the first guts check, uh, Duncan Robinson in the top hundred. What, what cracks me up about that is that I'm not inspiring. sure. I'm not, it was inspiring. Uh, one of the, <laughs> um, not as inspiring as Biscayne Bay Brewing, right, Alex? You finished with the beers, by the way? Very good. Them? Very good. Um, the funny thing about this is, before, if you, anybody had said before the year that Duncan Robinson was going to be named one of the top 100 players in the NBA, I'm not sure some Heat fans wanted him among the top 100 players that the Heat knew about. Like, or, I mean, there were, there were Heat fans who did not understand why he was on the roster. Yeah, there were um, people who wanted him cut. Oh, yeah. We can go find the receipts of the tweets. We're not going to do that because we're a friendly show, but, but, but they exist. And Duncan Robinson was definitely an afterthought. And to see um, even just some of the, the synergy numbers and stuff like that, it's pretty crazy. Well, the synergy. I mean, we were most are, wrong about Duncan Robinson, right? Like, I think yeah, as yeah. much as we talk about being wrong about Hero and Bam, at least we kind of knew about those guys. But no, at, at least a little bit, right? But Duncan Robinson – Wow, where we just everybody was wrong. Nobody saw this coming. Just like nobody, Kendrick Nunn, nobody those two coming. guys, nobody saw it coming. And well, the only person who may have seen it coming was Eric, who called him one of the best shooters on the planet. And Leif, I don't even, by the way, Leif, right, the, it, Leif is modest, but Leif was. I remember it, when Leif was tweeting that the that the Heat had interest in in picking him up way before even the draft. I remember that. 
but he was Leif not. Leif had big, it first, baby. I was watching Duncan <laughs> Robinson highlights because of Leif. Well, you got that Michigan connection. That was that whole Juwan Howard thing too. Uh, but Duncan was oh. not. Look, he was not somebody even stood out of Michigan. Really, I mean, even though he played in a national championship game, I mean, he wasn't. He didn't jump off the page at you. And even though Eric called him, you know, one of the greatest shooters in the world, whatever phrase it was, uh, you know, there still was really no path for him to play. Like, they, you know, like it was like, can he play defense at all? Can he finish it all? I mean, I asked him on, uh, we should we should get these clips because uh, some of this has been on the Zoom stuff. And I asked him about, you know, his finishing and he joked, you know, I'm not there that often. But he is, he's finishing at a ridiculously good rate. So in addition to this, you know, what he's shooting off dribble handoffs and everything else that they're doing, which is just obscene. Um, he's actually competent in other ways. The only thing he has to do is he's got to stay on the floor. And, you know, he, he's, he's sort of cursed with the white guy thing where the officials don't give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, early on in their careers, particularly until they prove they can defend. And he just hasn't proven it yet. But, yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Leif. So, anyway, excellent first guts check. Alex, thanks for making an appearance. Um, you'll be on with us a little bit more uh, tomorrow. Check out 5reasonsports.com, 5reasonsports.com. Thanks for nothing to nothing. Thanks for nothing. No, thanks for something to not, for nothing. <laughs> thanks for something. Sorry, this is, a, this is an episode where I choked out a pretzel. Uh, thanks for something, nothing but net channel on Dash Radio. Um, and also uh, check out the Biscayne Bay Brew and MaccaInc.net. Thank you for listening to The Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.